Hi, my name is James Clinton Howell, and this video essay is The Root Work Building, Interactive and Thematic Structure in The Last of Us. Today we're going to look at the game's design and how the game tells its story through that structure. Structure refers to the patterns that make a creative work coherent. Examples include rhythm and music, meter and poetry, and the five-act narrative and plays. It gives us a way to talk about the media that we experience, and also informs how we understand content. For example, we use these tools when we talk about the climax of a movie. A structural analysis looks at how something is put together, then relates how it's put together to what it says. The game's most important structure comes from the game design itself. We miss this when we look mainly for traditional narrative technique. The game design consists of player training, challenge escalation, and remixing familiar elements into new encounters. The Last of Us uses the general pattern of this design to tell its story and portray its fictional world. We'll look at the game design first, how it trains the player through text as well as trial and error, then how it remixes earlier set pieces to create novel challenges. We'll consider this with respect to player skills as well as level design. We'll see how it uses that pattern to blend interactivity and narration through shared problem-solving, whereby players actually perform the character's trust relationships. We'll also look at how that pattern emerges through interactive cues that pace and support the story. We'll consider how this structure of self-reference and revision creates a sense of continuity through pattern repetition rather than through straight narration alone. We'll look at a handful of the many examples of this in the game. We'll see how The Last of Us explores its themes using this pattern, and we'll wrap up by considering what this understanding of structure might mean for the game's ambiguous ending. Let's start by looking at gameplay and player training. Some games train players through written or verbal instructions alone. Others combine those explanations with interactive trial and error. For basic actions, The Last of Us uses a little bit of both. Sometimes it interrupts the flow to tell you how to perform basic actions. The game is usually less intrusive, though. Consider its tutorial for using a firearm. Help me! My mask broke. Don't, don't leave me to turn. Please. What do you want to do? The game gives us dramatic motivation with minimal direct instruction. We see the game function integrated with the fictional world. The game then gives you cause to use those skills. Now we have expectations of enemy behavior, and we know we can use close quarters combat when ammo runs out. We need to revise those expectations when we encounter a more difficult enemy, a clicker, and we're given this controlled space to experiment with. Trial and error shows that we can't get close for combat. This is the first challenge escalation. The enemy type is similar, but we've got tougher terms of engagement. So runners are basic and clickers are advanced. The Last of Us then mixes these elements together. Fighting runners and clickers together takes new tactics. The old knowledge is necessary, but it's not enough. We'll call this pattern remixing. The takeaway is that The Last of Us challenges players in two ways. First, it gives us a similar but tougher challenge in an expected setting. Second, it remixes familiar challenges together in an unfamiliar setting. Let's look at some other examples of challenge escalation. Midway through the game, Ellie runs away on a horse. Joel and Tommy pursue her on horseback as well. This is a low-demand setting where we learn to control a horse in The Last of Us. The challenge later escalates in a high-demand setting. Ellie must ride callous through a gauntlet of enemies. The narrative context is tense, so the player needs skills in hand to participate in that tension. The Last of Us supports its dramatic momentum by training the player for this tougher challenge. Our second example of player training and escalation shows how The Last of Us trains the player for different level designs. Joel's and Ellie's escape from the university is player training for Joel's fight into the Firefly headquarters. Both feature sprawling medical equipment, cloth triage gates, and blinding security lights. We're fighting through a band of scavengers who occupy our path of escape. 
Stealth is impossible here, and combat is the only way through. So we're looking at one central corridor connected to two large rooms by observation windows. The level design encourages three main strategies. First, lure enemies from one room to the other and kill them in transit. Second, use the rooms to flank enemies in the hall. Third, draw enemies to one location and circle around to catch them from behind. This is advanced player training. You know the basics. Now you're learning how to apply that to a specific space. The challenges here escalate in the Firefly Hospital in Salt Lake City. Joel once more fights through a harsh-lit medical facility with even more biohazard cloth hallways. The enemies are harder as well. Now Joel's up against a semi-professional military force with armor and powerful weapons. The level design elaborates upon the features that we saw in the university. Now we have several intersecting halls connected to more than two rooms with large observation windows. We perform the same tactics on a larger scale. The Fireflies have too much firepower to take head on, even from cover, so we use the same luring tactics as before to split up the soldiers and take them individually by surprise. We use observation windows to move through large rooms and flank enemies that won't be drawn out. And most frequently, we attack enemies in one location to draw them to that spot then we take advantage of the mobility afforded by the level design to attack them from another direction. These tactics are not wholly unique to this section, but their application to the level design is. The strong right angles of this area force Joel into duck and cover firefights. The enemies take a lot of hits because they're well armored, and their guns pack a wallop. Joel is at a disadvantage even with a lot of ammunition. We need to use the space resourcefully the way that we learned while escaping the university. We see the distinct features of that level design intensified. There are more windows, more rooms, and more corridors to negotiate. So we perform the old strategies on a larger scale. That wraps up our focused look at player training and challenge escalation. Now we'll look at examples of remixing familiar elements in unfamiliar contexts. Let's look at Joel's approach to the suburb sniper. This episode remixes elements that, by this point in the game, we've already encountered. Be careful. Back in Billstown, we were introduced to a suburban environment. From that experience, we know that houses have multiple entrances and exits. We also understand that we can run through the house in either direction to escape danger. Based off that previous challenge, we have some notion how to use these buildings to escape the sniper's gunfire. We have expectations of how space works in these houses. Second, we have the hunters themselves. We've just fought our way through their home city, so we encounter them here knowing enemy behavior and, as well, the best way to respond to them. When to aggress, and when to retreat. And third, we have the presence of an elevated, all-seeing eye. While escaping Pittsburgh with Henry, Joel had to approach a perch with a rifleman and a spotlight. If Joel gets caught, the rifleman on the catwalk above will open fire. In this later situation, enemy behavior and the consequences of being seen are the same as they were before. We enter this later encounter knowing what's expected of us. So those three elements are the referenced material from our experience playing the game. Now let's look at how this new context changes the way we use that knowledge. The sniper watches the front of the house while hunters lurk in the back. We can move through houses in Billstown in either direction. But not these. The sniper chases us inside, but once we go through that back door, we're stuck. Going back through the house would just put us back in the sniper's sights. We also can't take easy refuge indoors. The sniper can still hit Joel through the windows, and Joel is cornered by the hunters on the ground. The houses were once a means of escape in Billstown, but this changed context turns them into traps. 
That reversal is an effect of remixing. We have to modify tactics against the hunters as well. This time we don't have any space to retreat. The daytime open street level design gives the sniper a brighter, more open area to survey. The spotlight gave us windows of opportunity to move, and we lack that freedom now. We have to think about familiar space in a new way, and we have to think about familiar threats in a new way. Ellie's playable sequence, I think, is the high point of this pattern of player training and remixing as a form of interactive structure. For context, midway through the game, Joel sustains a serious injury. Player control then shifts from Joel over to Ellie. The game trains the player on the differences between Joel and Ellie right at the start. In the starting scenario, Ellie has to stalk and kill a buck. If she runs, the buck runs too. The Last of Us forces the player to stalk. Otherwise, the game won't progress. This is the game's first communication through interactivity that Ellie is not Joel. We also learn through playing the game that Ellie lacks Joel's technical knowledge. Joel can craft a variety of makeshift weapons and survival tools, and the game communicates character differences through interactivity when we lose some of these abilities. The game further emphasizes her stealth by taking away Joel's combat ability. Joel's most powerful weapons are gone. As a consequence, the game strips away our investment in head-on combat. Ellie has a switchblade, a handgun, a bow, and a hunting rifle. The handgun is weak, and it takes more time than is convenient to ready and draw a new arrow. The hunting rifle is powerful, but it carries three shots before Ellie needs to reload. And that reload time is slow. It's even cumbersome to switch out weapons in the middle of a fight. The game actually teases us with the possibility of overcoming these limitations. After all, Joel got stronger, why wouldn't it happen again? During Ellie's first encounter with David's men, she gets a shotgun. We might expect to build an arsenal as Joel had, but it's different this time. We have much more limited ammo, and it has a cumbersome delay between shots. Even beyond that, Ellie loses all of her weapons after getting captured. We briefly revisit the possibility of building an arsenal after her escape when she gets a revolver. However, using the revolver has a negative effect. The gunshot calls over more enemies than Ellie can handle. Once again, total stealth is the ideal strategy. Now, Ellie's switchblade does damage enemies, but it won't slow them down, which makes it more likely that Ellie will take damage. These are new restrictions that tell us not to play Ellie the same way that we have used Joel. The Last of Us emphasizes this difference by letting us compare their strengths directly in the middle of this episode. We briefly get control of Joel again. We experience their differences viscerally. By comparison, Joel can actually stop enemies with melee attacks. Whereas enemies were openly aggressive against Ellie, Joel is actually a source of pure terror for those who come after him. Just look at him run. Where is she? In combat, the game encourages Ellie to stay near David for support. Mutual reliance helps to offset and highlight Ellie's difficulty in combat. Ellie can one-hit kill enemies after stunning them with a throwable item. A hit-and-run approach is one of Ellie's most effective strategies. The cumulative lesson here is clear. Ellie is strongest in combat using distance, guile, and flight. However, her chances of survival increase dramatically when she sneaks rather than fights. The game elsewhere reinforces this lesson using both level design and enemy placement. After their first encounter with the infected, Ellie is dropped into a small maze populated entirely by clickers. On harder difficulties, combat is out of the question. Ellie has to use these holes in the wall to move forward. She also has to keep her distance from her enemies. This training through level design forces the player to keep a low profile. As well, it encourages the player to draw the clickers to one side of the wall to evade them on the other. 
The same element appears later. Ellie has to move through a band of David's men in an arcade. This is an example of challenge escalation. The enemy patterns are different, so we have to think about this design element in a new way. One solution calls for a sound distraction, followed by sneaking around her aggressors. As we saw earlier, combat is not the best way through. Each episode reinforces the need for guile and stealth. The Last of Us reinforces guile as a strategy when it teaches us to use Ellie's footsteps as an enemy distraction. After Ellie escapes that concrete maze filled with clickers, David boosts her onto an industrial catwalk to retrieve a ladder. We use Ellie's footsteps on the catwalk to draw the clicker out. As a side note, The Last of Us foreshadows the player training in Ellie's section in an unrelated conversation between hunters in Pittsburgh. We were up all night chasing the tourists. Oh yeah, you were a part of that? I heard about this. Yeah, this one chick, she would just not give up. I've never seen anyone with so much fucking energy. It took a couple minutes to snuff everyone else, and fucking five hours to hunt her ass down. Jesus. Sometimes you gotta earn your keep, right? Yeah, I guess. We are about to give up when she started shooting at us. It's stupid. She could have got away. I had two other guys keep her busy. I took out my rifle. Lined up her little head in the crosshairs, and pow! That was that. Damn. Well, maybe you should have kept her. You know, made her one of us. No, no way. That girl, she'd have killed us all in her sleep. We'll get to why that parallel is important later. All of these lessons prepare us for their eventual remixing in a new context Ellie's fight against David. To quote a cohort, Heather Ann Campbell, this sequence strips video games down to the beginning. We're playing Pac-Man in a burning maze of countertops, and we're the ghost trying to catch the one who would devour us. End quote. Everything up to this point has taught us how to catch our consumer. Ellie is in a maze-like restaurant with linear corridors that force her to crouch in order to remain safe. That's because David will shoot at her if she stands up. This is a new kind of level design but we intuit how it works because of the earlier emphasis on stealth. David acts very much like a clicker. Touching either will result in a one-hit death. The level design further associates David's behavior with clickers. Oops. Here we have a new environmental feature. Broken dishes on the floor will call David's attention and break Ellie's stealth. He responds to noise like clickers do. I heard that. Humans respond to noise as well, of course. However, we've learned to use noise from Ellie's immediate location as a way of dealing with clickers as a specific enemy type. We use that same knowledge here. This is a new context for the clicker luring tactics that we learned in the lumber mill. Ellie drew clickers out to evade them before. Now we use that knowledge strategically to catch David from behind. Ellie's way of attacking David is significant as well. She hits him from behind with her switchblade. This harkens back to the stealth tactics we learned when dealing with uninfected humans. The Last of Us remixes infected and uninfected enemy types in David's behaviors and tactics. It does add something new, though. David sneaks and peers around corners, just as Joel does under the player's control. We'll revisit the significance of this later. So this shows how The Last of Us uses player training, challenge escalation, and remixing in a focused way during Ellie's sequence. The game refers back to the player's familiarity with Joel as a contrast to understanding Ellie. It encourages the player to handle human enemies with a focused set of skills, specifically stealth and hit-and-run attacks. It uses level design and enemy placement to get the player using stealth tactics without overtly telling the player to use Ellie stealthily. Finally, it concentrates all of these elements into a single encounter that refers back to all the knowledge the player has learned thus far. This describes the foundational pattern explored in this video essay. We find the structuring pattern here first. The rest of the game builds off of its interactive design. 